Dream told me the plan and I said I'm with it We jumped in the car and went straight to the riches Yeah, we went straight to the riches He told me this one gon' bust both of our wrists I told him he playing, he says no gimmicks I told him let's get in, I told him let's get in like Who the fuck is Moji, man? I don't know who Moji is But I seen Drake on this shit So I'm assuming Drake put him on and he fucked up He fucked the bag up That's what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna assume that But feel me? Don't forget to go shop up, man. Shop at SolarDream.com. Go get you some t-shirts. I got some cool graphics on there. I got some sweatsuits on there. Feel me? And some shorts. I know it's getting hot. But let's get it. Lock and fly out. Let's lock and fly out, gang. Let's go. Moji was once the most beloved figure in Toronto. From creating what many refer to as the unofficial anthem. For the streets of the six. To working with the likes of Drake at just 18 years old, he was destined for greatness. He had the bars, the charisma, and the connections, but no more than five years after entering the scene, he self-destructed. On today's episode of Tales of Shut Toronto, up. we're gonna take a closer look at Moji's meteoric rise to stardom and analyze what caused the downward spiral of his once promising career. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Okay, yeah. Yo, what happened to what happened to Moji? I heard about him. Is Moji a real like? Is he really tapped in? Yeah. Have you ever ever heard in the history of hip hop, a man that gives away his creativity and helps make Billboard hits, but doesn't get paid a dollar for it, one credit? For it. After calling out Drake last week, Moji posted a picture suggesting he was the target of a violent assault at the hands of Ovio. Man, that game it don't love ya. Hey, fuck Moji. Take a piss. Hey, fuck my cousin Moji. Even if I love you, I don't trust ya. I don't. It's gonna be a hot Drake put hands and feet on him? Mohammed Badan, better known by his stage name Moji, proudly represents the downtown Toronto neighborhood of Regent Park. When he was two, his parents relocated him and his eight siblings from Jane and Finch to here, the south side of Toronto's first and largest Canadian housing project. He grew up on Sutton Avenue, which was once predominantly Somali and working class, just like his parents. The block might look familiar to some, because it's been home to several hit movies, TV shows, and even award-winning musicians. Despite its rich history, Regent Park's reputation was tarnished when escalating gun violence reached its peak in 1995. To combat the issue, Toronto Police's 51 Division would conduct numerous raids in the area, but this only made things worse. Residents began calling out 51 Division officers for being the aggressors during their many enforcement blitzes, and by August of 1995, tensions reached a boiling point when hundreds of residents and police officers clashed in what is now known as the riot in Regent Park. The chaos didn't stop there, as a number of local street gangs were formed to deter the police from re-entering the neighborhood, and according to some residents, it worked. Unfortunately, as the years progressed, tension between 51 division officers and Regent Park residents only got thicker. In fact, this was one of the few reasons Mo G dropped out of school at just 10 years old. What the fuck you do at 10? When, uh, when they bring a cop to a classroom when you're a little kid and, and then yeah. the cop's just in the classroom yeah. looking at us like, yo, I'm going to pack when you guys grow up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what happened to me at school. That's why I dropped out of school when I was 10 years old. You see when I say I dropped out when I was in grade 4, this really happened. Mm -hmm. Mentally, I left school at the mm -hmm. age of 10. You know why? Because mm -hmm. they brought feds to the school. Violation. You know what I'm saying? Super violation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And this is, this so is, guess what I did? I just left the whole classroom. Mm -hmm. I went to the mosque right across the street. I never came back to school ever again. Okay, you see what you What the fuck? I'm not gonna lie, his hat is tough. That's why I really paused it, because the M, and he put the O, that's tough, that's tough, that's tough. But, um, what the fuck do you do at 10 years old and don't go to school? Like, and another question is, like, I'm, I'm assuming at that age, you know, like, when they ask you, like, what you want to be when you grow up, feel me? And they might bring, like, a firefighter to the, to the school, maybe a cop. In his case, it was a cop. And I think he might not like, he might have not just like cops. And he probably just took it the wrong way. But I think they were just like, probably having one of those days at school when they was like, you know, bringing like a role model or like, feel me? One of those figures that you could be in, in when you grow up type shit and then trying to inspire the, um, inspire the kids or some shit like that. Maybe. I don't know. But let's see. Let's see. Just right now. <laughs> I never came back. <laughs> Except for a two-week stint at the exhibition place, Moji has never worked for anyone but himself. Rather, as his oldest friend Jabril puts it, Mo was in Regent Park with his friends, getting that street education. Street education and all that comes with it, 
rapping in basements, hustling in the streets, has occupied the majority of Moji's life. That same street education also helped catapult him into stardom before he even turned 18. Yeah, that's not too smart though. Not gonna lie. He dropped out of school because the police looked at him and said, I'm a pack. During his teen years, Moji spent a significant portion of the early part of the day alone at home, either asleep or lounging. His nights, however, were a different story. They were long, spontaneous excursion filled nights that start at one place, like a Raba, and end up in another, like a studio. It's out of this lifestyle that eight years ago, Moji was born through his best known song, Still by the Raba. An unofficial anthem for the streets of Toronto, the song speaks of moving product and the Raba, among other things. When explaining how the hit record came about, Moji says he went home and told his brother to turn on his phone and record him freestyling. Loaded with cash and excited, he then went to his friend's house and roasted all of them one by one. As Moji remembers it, I gave everyone a hot 16, making fun of them. Later that night, he would go on to write Still by the Raba with his childhood friend, Smoke Dog using an instrumental he found on YouTube and the bars he freestyled earlier that day. Fast forward to October 4th, 2014, the music video was recorded and uploaded on YouTube. It gained over 100,000 views before Moji took it down out of respect for his best friend Ano, who died just two days after the video was released. In an interview with MTV News back in 2016, it's Moji explained the reason behind taking the video down. He's smoking and drinking in the video. I'm a spiritual guy, you know, I don't like his family seeing that. I was holding Camry in my hand, and if I die, I don't want people seeing that. You know what I'm saying? That stuff is gonna burn me in hell. So why do it? Why are you doing it then? What the fuck? Police were called to Shooter Street near Parliament on October 6, 2014 for the sound of gunshots. 18-year-old Yusuf Ali was taken to hospital with multiple gunshot Damn. wounds where he later died. Rest in peace. The suspect, who was wearing all black with a hoodie, was last seen heading north on Regent Street. So investigators will provide an update for us at 10.30 this morning. <laughs> Yusuf Ali, often referred to as Ano by loved ones, was described by those same people as a peacemaker and a community leader in Regent Park. He's bridged a lot of different relationships. People knew him and he was kind, no matter who you were. Before entering high school, Ano had been captain of multiple sports teams and even won an Athlete of the Year award, but as he entered grade 9 at Jarvis Collegiate, it became harder for him to stay focused. Soon, he began skipping school nearly every day with his best friend, Moji, and was completely caught up in the negatives of Regent Park. During the early 2000s, See, bro, Ano, I'm sorry, Ano or Ali, feel me? Um, yeah, see, he was playing sports, he was doing, he was doing what he had to do. Moji, remember, he wasn't in school, so he was kind of like, he was in the street, so he was kind of like the bad influence, though, feel me? So he, he bought my guy, he bought, he bought... Uh, Ano, feel me? So Ano was going to school, but he, he got distracted, feel me? So fucked up his life. Hustling in the streets of that, Regent you know, Park came with a price. Life. As previously mentioned, the block was plagued by senseless gun violence, but what most don't know was that a lot of it arose from internal gang disputes. As the violence escalated throughout the 2010s, it gained coverage by a number of Canadian media outlets, with one going as far as describing the situation as a quote-unquote internal cleansing. Now this is not internal to say Ano's situation cleansing. had anything to do with the internal gang disputes within his community, but based off the details provided by Toronto police, it's a theory worth considering. So let's take a closer look at Ano's case. Please. On October 6, 2014, 18-year-old Ano was walking with two of his friends in an alleyway near Queen and Parliament Street at approximately 2.45 p.m. when he was shot in the back multiple times by a lone gunman. Toronto police quickly obtained surveillance footage in the surrounding area and what they managed to find shocked them. First, cameras caught the lone gunman following Ano through several different laneways for at least five minutes in a very determined fashion before opening fire. In addition to this, the two friends who witnessed the entire incident unfold were left unharmed, suggesting Ano was the intended target of the brazen daylight assassination. 
After further investigation, the firearm used in the killing was found to be linked to one other offense that occurred in a different part of the city, but that still wasn't enough information to link officers to a suspect. The city's no way, bro. So I'm with, I'm with two of my friends, feel me? And they, they didn't shoot back. They didn't even try to... Damn, they didn't... Damn, no get back for me, bro. That's tough, man. Chief of Police at the time, too. Mark Saunders, placed a $50,000 reward for any information leading to the killer. But to this day, Anno's murder is still unsolved. During no, his 2016 that. MTV interview, Moji detailed how the incident impacted him. In one instance, he had to take out Anno's braids to prep him for his wake, and while doing so, he'd seen the bullet holes in the back of his head. It was Anno who Moji skipped school with every day. It was Anno who was bumping still by the rabba everywhere he went, and it was Anno who told Moji to pursue his dream of rapping. Those Nearly a year after Anno's right untimely it. passing, still was re-uploaded by a fan. This time, it didn't take off right away, because the scene was now dominated by a new rap collective based out of the backyard of Regent Park, otherwise known as the Esplanade. Ah, uh, Prime Forever. The Prime Boys is an Esplanade-raised rap group consisting of three members, Donnie, Jay Wiss, and Jimmy Prime. Most may recognize Jimmy as the one who coined the now widely used term, the Six, as a nickname for Toronto. It is in reference to the city's six boroughs and area codes, 416 and 647. The term was created while Jimmy was brainstorming with Drake's manager, Oliver L. Cadib. The two knew each other since 2014 and would often collaborate on projects together. One of them was Jimmy Prime's single, Northside. On the set of the music video, Oliver was there providing creative assistance. There too was Safe Musad, better known by his stage name, Safe. Safe is also an Esplanade native, who at the time was just an aspiring artist posting his tunes on SoundCloud. Oliver I believe Safe Safe just dropped the album though. I don't know. Like within this no last year. I think Safe dropped the album last year. I think I tapped into Safe before would invite him to attend the opening of OVO's Toronto pop-up store, where he was asked if he wanted to work steadily at the newly opened boutique. And as expected, Safe pounced at the opportunity. As he spent more time around the shop, his relationship with Oliver continued to strengthen. This is when he took the chance to introduce Oliver to not only his own music, but his friend Mo G's as well. Oliver seemed to like Still by the Rabba so much he sent the track to Drake, and soon after, all of the pieces needed to become a star came together naturally for Moji. March 25th, 2015, the rise of Moji begins here, after Drake posted a clip of Still to his Instagram, captioning it, Ginobili dance all summer. Okay, Although the music video was deleted for a second time, it was re-uploaded again nah, on July 27th. 2015 and it still managed to earn impressive numbers three days later smoke dog released his hit single trap house that same day drake's highly publicized beef with philadelphia based rapper meek mill would reach its peak after drake dropped back to back a diss track that sent the hip-hop world in a frenzy fast forward a month drake's highly controversial music video for his hit single energy was released as he's sending subliminal shots left right and center drake can also be seen doing a rather unique nah, dance one moji had innovated called the ginobili if the dance seems familiar it's because it's a spin-off of chicago drill rapper lil j's bop Drake would later reference the Ginobili in his hit song, Jumpman, featuring Future. I hit that, with my living, all right. Woo. that track would later be released on their collaborative mixtape, What a Time to Be Alive, which is now quadruple platinum. Within a year of entering the rap game, Mo G had officially been co-signed by the biggest rapper in the world. This was huge, not just for him, but for Toronto's music scene as a whole. The consistent support from the boy shined a light on a scene that was waiting for the perfect moment to erupt, and that it did. See, like I bet before we even get to the madness, that I already see what's about to happen. Like, I can see. To me, when people get these opportunities right here, because Drake is gonna give you two opportunities so for what I've seen so far. He either gonna, he either gonna shout you out, feel me, like post you on on the story, feel me, might even take a picture with you, type shit. Feel me? Or 
he gonna give you that verse. So in his case, I'm assuming, cause I ain't see, so I ain't see everything. I'm assuming he he going to shout out bro, like he shouting him out, doing the Ginobili and the dance and shit like that. Moji is supposed to take this opportunity and drop that heat. Feel me? Drop that heat. Keep getting the light from Drake. Feel me? Keep getting that light, but keep dropping that heat so people start being like, oh, all right, let me fuck with him. Let me fuck with him. Feel me? Let's see what he do. Let's see if he take that opportunity. Go, oh, nigga. That's what you're supposed to do. Go. You're listening to Mobio Sound Radio on Sound 42. Broadcasting live from Toronto, Kansas. Throughout the remainder of 2015, Moji, Smoke Dog, and Safe would have earned significant airtime on Drake's radio station, OVO Sound Radio. The three friends would then join forces to form their own rap collective called Halal Gang, alongside their two other musically inclined friends, Puffy Ells and Mustafa the Poet. Fast forward to December, Safe was hosting his debut album release party at the iconic entertainment venue, Mod Club, and would bring the gang with him. The since-closed establishment had a reputation for hosting artists before their rise to stardom, and on December 13, 2015, that reputation remained true. The OVO-sponsored event featured a star-studded lineup, from Prime Boys to Ram Riddles. The every artist at the event were at the peak of their careers, which made for one hell of a show. To close in historic fashion, Safe decided to have the song of the year performed live for the very first time. Moji completely shined that night. As he ginobili across the stage, his energy was infectious, spreading throughout the crowd. Although he wasn't at the show, Drake caught wind of the monumental night from his OVO brethren who were in attendance and decided to upload two congratulatory Instagram posts. The first one was captioned, Starboy from the sixth side, Ano Gang, big up safe for selling out my club, wish I was there to see the guy shine. The second photo was captioned, Ginobili all summer like I said I would, rest in peace Ano. The pieces for a monumental career came together organically for Moji, who naturally motivated and hungry for more, would spend the remainder of the year in and out of studios across the city, producing his debut EP. With the help of Drake, who reportedly helped fund the project, Off Boy was released just 10 days into the new year. It featured three songs, including the classic, Wiggins, a tribute to the Toronto-bred Golden State Warriors' small forward. Also on the EP... Wait, Andrew Wiggins is... Canadian? Canadian professional basketball player. I never knew Andrew Wiggins was Canadian. That shit's crazy. Oh shit. Yeah, I got them out there, gang. Yep. P was a song called Mind Symphony, an anthem dedicated to his fallen friend, Ano. Come off this fucking earth, fucking earth. When you died, I was sitting on the curb. Couldn't breathe, couldn't feel a nerve. Seeing 80 crews swerve, hearing birds trip. That sound of name and you get murdered. Even with all that's begun to manifest for Moji, his life and his thoughts all seemed to pivot on Ano, and more specifically on Ano's death. Moji didn't manifest any of this by being prayerful. He never thought Drake would co-sign him or that his best friend would die. All of the variables in Moji's life and career trajectory were out of his control. We've seen many rappers come before him, just as eccentric and dynamic, but their stars tend to dim and fade out. Perhaps what sets Moji apart is all his grief, all his heart. A little over two weeks after releasing his debut EP, Moji would receive yet another shout out from the boy, but this time he was direct. January 30th, 2016, Drake would name drop Moji on Summer 16, a single that was reported to be on his upcoming album, Views. The name drop was huge, mainly because the record debuted at number 6 on the US Billboard Hot 100, selling 215,000 downloads in its first week. These sales became the highest debut sales of Drake's career. For Moji at this point, Drake wasn't some elusive figure of Toronto, or the sixth god, as some would refer to him as. Instead, he referred to Drake as a big brother. Two months after the release of Summer 16, Moji would talk in depth with MTV about Drake's impact on not just his career, but Toronto's music scene as a whole. That nigga Drake, that's my guy, you know what I'm saying? That's my nigga right there, that's my brother, you know what I'm saying? That's my big brother, you know what I'm saying? If it wasn't for Drake, you know what I'm saying? The city wouldn't be the same. Toronto wouldn't even have attention like that, you know what I'm saying? He put on for Canada, he gave niggas. 
that USA passport. It's not easy, I mean, as a Canadian rapper, to be out there in America, you know, it's a big field, you know what I'm saying? It's not really easy, it's tough. He did it, he's one of, he's, he's the biggest rapper in the game right now, the best rapper in the game right now. Much respect, you know what I'm saying? He's a legend. That's my guy, you know what I'm saying? At this point, it would be safe to assume Drake and Moji had developed a solid brotherhood, but as improbable as it may seem, not even two weeks after the release of this interview, that brotherhood would come to an end. Have you ever ever heard in the history of hip hop a man that gives away his creativity and helps make billboard hits but doesn't get paid a dollar for it, one credit for it, and here stuck in the hood? You know what I'm saying? That doesn't make sense, but exposing these will make sense. It's awesome. Oliver's a snake ass, double headed snake ass, psychotic looking mo. Always stirring the pot, telling me you're on, I want to make the music video shoot with Drake, they don't want me to come. All Drake's friends hate you, Drake doesn't like you. Always stirring the pot, you. Oliver is a shady ass white boy, culture vulture ass, snake ass, nerd, a dweeb, everything. Begs me to wear his clothes and advertise. That's why I used to wear his clothes. I thought we was family with OVO, but he paid me a dollar after they stole my ways to trying to hide me from the world and hide me from the. This Oliver told me the whole OVO team thinks I deserve a compensation for everything Drake took from me. And all the man just offered me is $500. $500? Can't even pay mama's rent. What do you swear? Yeah, $500 can't pay mama's rent, but. He fucked up though, because yes, we like, we like that he's exposed and he, he keeping it real with us though, feel me? But the people with the money, the people that really got control, they don't like this, feel me? They give him pow pow for that shit type shit like that, feel me? And it's like, alright, you wanna, you wanna talk bad on us, feel me? Like, and we was trying to help you, we funded your album, you feel me? We shouted you out and shit like that. So now you wanna you wanna you wanna talk on us? Alright, so feel me, they might they might like the upper feel me, the upper people might hold him back like nah, that's not promoted to these these type of people, and that's not promoted to these type of people. And then when he try to wanna work with other people, they gonna be like, nah, you bash Drake, you bashed Oliver. So if we do something wrong, you might bash us too. So that's why he fucked up. He should have just kept using Drake like Drake was using him. And then that was it. Feel me? Just keep getting your fans and get your money, feel me? Once you do this, you kind of fucking yourself. Don't did it. Smoking drugs, brother. You taking. You look like you Fiend. In a series of since deleted videos posted on Moji's Instagram account, he would call out Drake and his manager Oliver over unpaid contributions to Drake's upcoming album, Views. He would later add more fuel to the fire by airing out what many have heard in the past. Drake uses ghostwriters, but according to Moji, pinning hits is one thing, and being compensated for his work is another. In one of many posts, Moji shows a screenshot of a DM conversation between him and Drake, where Drake asks him for a voice recording to use on Views. Underneath it was captioned, this is a title of a song on Views. After I did this shit, Oliver put me in the studio, and he said they need new hooks, new flows, and bars, and shit. I didn't want to be on these album cause I'm not a slave, only slave of Allah, not no, the fake ass be on God. Album. It only gets deeper. Stop playing with me little forest hill creature. These accusations are almost identical to the Quentin Miller situation, who was not only outed as Drake's ghost writer, but had multiple reference tracks leaked. One thing I don't even, one thing, I don't care, like, cause you know, like, the rap people be like, oh, if you don't write your own music, like, you ain't the, the GOAT or some shit like that. I personally don't care, like, if you write your music or you don't write your music, it's like, how you deliver the music, feel me? Quentin Miller, he probably don't deliver the music the right way that we like it, feel me? But Drake do. So, for me, like I said, use people like how they use you, but I think Quentin Miller should have got paid a little more, feel me? Or shouted out, you know, saying, like... He helped on the album, not he wrote shit, but he helped. The ordeal sent shockwaves throughout the music industry, and even though he ended the rant off by saying he would have kept quiet if he was properly compensated, Moji outing Drake and his team in such a manner was the wrong move for so many reasons. Not only was he burning bridges for himself and others, but he became enemy number one to the wrong person. You see, leading up to this altercation, Drake was already in hot water after being involved in a string of violent incidents. 
It started in 2014 when two groupies on Instagram accused Drake of threatening them. One of the women stated Drake sent thugs from his entourage to her apartment and they threatened her for speaking out about having sex with him. While the other woman filed a police report stating Drake had threatened her for posting pictures of designer bags that he purchased for her. A few months after that, rapper and songwriter Quentin Miller was outed as Drake's ghostwriter, which so Drake Let's not say Drake sent this guy. Drake went to the girl's house and said, Yo, can you stop telling people we had sex? What is wrong with that? Then he told the other girl, Can you please stop telling people? Can you, can you please stop posting that I bought you bags? Feel me? I got other women out here. You can't be doing that. Feel me? Nah, they want to go to TMZ. That shit is whack. After that, rapper and songwriter Quentin Miller was outed as Drake's ghostwriter, which turned into a bitter public dispute with Meek Mill, who called out Drake publicly on Twitter. According to Quentin Miller, Meek move. caught him at a Nike store in Beverly Hills shortly after the Twitter dispute and wanted confirmation about the ghostwriting allegations. When Meek didn't get the answers he wanted, he went on the attack. Later that same year, Detail, a prominent music producer, was offered the elusive gig as Drake's executive producer. Known for creating hits like How to Love by Lil Wayne and Beyonce's Drunken Love, which earned him his first Grammy, it's easy to see why you would want this guy on your team, but in order to work with a more diverse clientele, Detail declined the offer. Drake didn't handle the rejection well. According to TMZ, who first uncovered the incident, Drake allegedly invited Detail to a meeting at his home in Cali to work on a new project after their monster collab on Nothing was the same. When Detail showed up at around 2 in the morning, he says it was the rapper's right-hand man, Chubbs, who greeted him instead. Chubbs ambushed Detail, and during the alleged beat down, which Detail insisted was and set up Drake by Drake, so? Chubbs supposedly yelled, I will punk? beat all your asses, including your bitches. I don't give a f I will hit you again. Do you think Drake is soft? Do you think Drake's a punk? Detail received a broken jaw and multiple other injuries that required surgery following the run-in. He says he was so badly hurt he couldn't work for a year. He asked Drake repeatedly, and in vain, to cover his medical expenses. When Drake refused, the beaten producers sued two years after the incident, but the lawsuit was thrown out when Detail was arrested by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and charged with five women and assaulting another. He is co You was about to get the biggest payday of your life, gang, and you decide to go do that to some women? And the, I mean the other part, like, come on, son. That, these is dumb moves right here, gang. You could have just been patient and then you could have got the bread, feel me? But you thinking your mind is fucked up. That's crazy. After the incident, but the lawsuit was thrown out when Detail was arrested by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and charged with five women and assaulting another. He is currently being held on bail of $6.3 million. Damn. Drake and the OVO Damn. goons weren't to be played with, but apparently Mo G didn't get the memo, because not Jeez, even a week right after his it. initial posts went viral, like, yeah, he continued berating the rapper and his team on Instagram. This time he took it a step further, by leaking an unreleased song. Alright, just to let the world know, I never got paid no 12 He's grand. fucking up big time. For the record, I'm not signed to OVO. He's fucking up. And all my real fans have been rocking with me from day one. Check the history. I always delete all my posts and I deleted it because I got bigger info coming to you right now. As we Too much talking these days. Fuck up. <laughs> Think about somebody leak your money, gang. That's leak your money. Feel me? That's it. This is money right here. Feel me? you going to want to get back. You want to. Let me teach him a lesson. Give him a little pow pow. He's smiling and shit. With the entire situation unraveling on social media for the world to see, Drake would reply to Mo G with just a single Instagram post, simply captioned, The bright lights are supposed to inspire you, not fry your brain. This would be the only time Drake would acknowledge Mo G. Well, publicly that is. After calling out Drake last week, Mo G posted a picture suggesting he was the target of a violent assault at the hands of Ovio. He didn't take his opportunity and run with it. He April 1st, 2016, a graphic photo of Mo G's swollen and bloodied face would be uploaded to his Instagram. It was captioned, when you speak from your heart, this is what happens, hashtag dirty society, hashtag dirty industry. The post went viral instantly, 
with numerous media outlets covering the situation, and with it being uploaded on April Fool's Day, many assumed it was a prank, but it wasn't, this was real. Across the border, the incident basically turned into a meme, with many influencers taking the opportunity to clown the bloodied rapper. Rapper turned podcaster Joe Budden was one of them. He tweeted, rapper I love that Moji with the dance moves line a lot more, before I actually saw Moji. I ain't wanna move like Moji after that. As this was happening, people were speculating the OVO Defense League were directly involved in the brazen assault. Now, that may seem obvious to most, but within the streets of the Screwface capital, there were whispers suggesting Halal Gang orchestrated the attack. There are several points backing this claim. First, Moji never directly accused Drake or OVO of jumping him. Second, a week before he was jumped, Moji unfollowed all Halal Gang members and associates on Instagram he's and they reciprocated up. the energy. Moments up. later, Smoke Dog posted a photo of Halal Gang linked up with OVO, but cropped out of the picture was Moji. It was captioned, ain't shit change, but the weather, de real no, hashtag H Gang. To further add fuel to the fire, Smoke Dog tweeted then deleted the following. Nick need to stop begging for attention now. It's getting ridiculous, hashtag shaking my head. After receiving backlash for the tweet, with some going as far as saying he was turning his back on his friend, Smoke Dog would attempt to clear the air by tweeting, LOL, Moji my we ain't beefing. Laughing emoji, stupid people. He followed this up by calling academics a slur after he posted a few. Nah, the way that he read it, I don't take it hype. Moji my nigga. Like, the way that he read it, he said, like, Moji. Like, that's my nigga. We ain't beefing, stupid people. <coughs> he saying Moji, my nigga. Like, Moji, my nigga. We not beefing, stupid people. Like, he talking to Moji. Stupid people. He followed this up by calling academics a slur after he posted a few videos covering the altercation. Now, this could have all been one big coincidence. Regardless, Moji still wasn't phased. The day after revealing he had been jumped, Moji would capitalize on the mass attention it garnered by dropping the music video for his hit song, Wiggins. Do whatever you feel, do whatever you want. I'll be ballin' so hard, you'll think that I'm Wiggins. I'll be cashing checks, they be catching feelings while you mad. The M Works powered visuals had everyone talking, but the first thing people noticed was Moji's face. It was unharmed, suggesting the video was initially recorded before his violent encounter with the OVO defense squad. Regardless, he was intent with the timing of its release, because towards the end the of the video, it cuts to him laying down several pieces of OVO apparel on the mud beneath him. He then douses the gear in gasoline and sets it aflame, marking the end of his affiliations with Drake and OVO. Per usual, Drake refused to acknowledge the spectacle and would go on to release his record-breaking album, Views, on April 29th. But something was off. A song was missing. Summer 16, the song Moji was name dropped on, was pulled from the album last minute. An exact reason was never revealed, but I think we all can out. figure out why. The ordeal sparked a new dialogue surrounding Drake and his rise to stardom. Is he a culture vulture like Moji claims he is? First off, Drake's influence and impact on the city of Toronto cannot be overlooked. Throughout his career, he has acknowledged the different nuances of the city that raised him and the various people who identify within different regions of the city. For example, the Jamaican and Somali culture in Toronto is strong, and Drake has managed to incorporate it into his widely accepted music. Know some Somalis that say we got it, wallahi. On the other hand, many have made note on the timing of some of Drake's most successful songs and collaborations. From grime to Afrobeats to dancehall to drill, Drizzy has notoriously dabbled in multiple genres of music, but he only seems to incorporate elements of these genres when they are at the peak of their popularity. As the culture vulture narrative started gaining traction, Hawa Meyer, a scholar who studies Somali diaspora, claims that some Toronto artists' efforts to popularize traditional terms are a riff off of the orality and metaphoric ways of being and speaking. As for Drake specifically, Meyer states, Drake's cultural capital right now is coming from Somali kids, and he doesn't adequately compensate them for it. Thus, his authenticity comes into question. 2016 was a year full of ups and downs for Moji, but despite everything, he would end the life-changing year off with one more classic. 
I don't rock with moon after kings. I'm selling rocks to the fiends. I keep a glass on with some mean. And my pockets stay fat in my diesel jeans. Akira Mode was released on October 26, 2016, two days after Drake's birthday, as a final dig at the rapper and his OVO namesake. The single is religiously worded, aimed at rebuking and castrating his critics and those who he once called friends. The term Akira refers to the afterlife or judgment day. By invoking the Akira, Moji is reminding his haters and comrades alike to stay honorable, loyal, and to not give in to the devil like that which turned many of those he once called family against him. He also references the term Moon Hafakins, an Arabic word whose literal meaning is hypocrite. In the context of the song, however, the term is being used to refer to backstabbers or sellouts. In a play of words, he is most likely aiming the diss towards his former crew, reminding them of the Akira and warning others about the Moon Hafakins. The progression of Moji's career would begin to decline after the release of Akira Mode, but what really put the nail in the coffin was when his sister unexpectedly passed away at the beginning of the new year. It was widely speculated she unalived herself, but this was never confirmed. Understandably, this took a toll on Moji. He would delete all of his past projects and remain inactive on all socials for nearly two years after her death. Fans soon began theorizing he had not only officially called it quits on the rap game, but severed ties with his Regent Park brothers. That narrative, however, was quickly shut down after pictures of them linked up in the UK for Drake's Boy Meets World Tour surfaced around spring of 2017. Then on December 9th, in collaboration with Puffy L's, Mo G would make his return to the rap scene with the hit, Black Rabba. And when we pull up in the city, they like, whoa. Moji's back, drop the new track, they like, whoa. Spent 10 stacks on the kicks, they like, whoa. She say she like the way a nigga live, I'm like, whoa. Money ain't a problem, baby girl, he gets dope. It appears the near two-year hiatus did wonders for Moji, as he began taking the necessary steps to repair the bridges he once burned, but unlike Halal Gang, some people weren't as quick to forgive. In this industry, I'll tell you, none of, none of these people, none of you guys, any of you guys in this industry, none of you guys tell the truth. That's the truth about the industry. Bottom line, I want to hear that, you know, like I'm banned from the building. Like, David Fu can't have you back. Yeah, I'm not really oh, nigga, no. you beefing with Drake. So even if I'm yeah, paying you for a session, no, nigga. Like you just said, you came down, like you just said, you were just like kind of harassing people that are talent demanding that you record, they record you, and I said, yeah, you can't have them back. I said, okay. I was harassing people. What's that? I said I was harassing people. Is that what you said? Something like that. That's what I, that's what that's what he said. Yeah, Some, something like that. I'm not sure. Drake got more money than you, my. On May 16, 2018, oh, a seven-minute video of a recorded phone call between a local studio owner and Moji would be posted to his Instagram. Underneath it was captioned, Dear fans, I've been blackballed for the past two years now. I'm banned from 99.9% .9 of studios in Toronto. I'm banned from all clubs. I'm banned from doing shows. And I'm banned from doing appearances. When I get lucky and find a studio, engineers salt up my whole thing. They turn my headphones up on full blast on some hater shit. My word, they move like Joe Budden. They don't mix and master my music, they refuse to do it. All type of hate I get, Toronto is a city full of D-writers and haters, my word, on everything I love. And they wonder why I stopped rapping for two years. No opportunity, it's simple, by Instagram. It when you had the opportunity, you fucked it up. It doesn't look like Moji kept his word about quitting, because within the same week this call was posted, he would drop three songs. With the timing of the new music, the blackballed accusations looked like a promo stunt, and Toronto's underground scene didn't hesitate to share their displeasure. From bloggers to rappers to fans, Moji was bombarded with hate. The once adored rapper was now being exiled by the same community that initially embraced him with open arms, but all of this was quickly forgotten when just a month later, tragedy strikes. Damn. Sirens blaring an ambulance rushes through this crowded strip at the same time that a woman is pleading for one. 
She has just seen a body on the ground. The scene too graphic to show, but it was what so many people on Queen West saw with their own eyes yesterday. This when he got shot the outside. They, they called him too. down. The horrific video has been making the rounds on social media. Friends identifying the man as Javante Smart, better known as Smoke Dog, an up-and-coming hip-hop artist, remembered as a bright young man with a beautiful personality. Smoke Dog's unexpected death left an everlasting impact on the city's rap scene. New alliances, and especially rivalries, were formed, but for Mo G, it was deeper than rap. In a series of since-deleted Instagram posts and stories, he would pour his heart out for his fallen friend, telling Smokey he loved him, and promising he would never perform their hit song again. But Mo G, being the unpredictable man that he is, would be back to his 2016 ways not even a week after the passing of his friend, making erratic posts on Instagram, even dissing Drake once again. What the fuck did this nigga talk about? A nigga like me, I don't own Apple Music, I don't own Tidal, I don't own Spotify, I don't own none of that shit. Nigga like me, from the, I don't got none of them platforms on my phone. But I just heard somebody in the spot playing Drake's out. I heard the nigga say, all pop mollies, my mollies pop niggas. I am a cream of the crop nigga. You niggas pop mollies, my mollies pop niggas. Somalians. Ooh. Where these mollies at that free popping niggas? I don't know what the hell this nigga be talking about. About his molly pops nigga. I never seen Drake with no mollies. I think I'm no. Look at the walk. Seen. Look at the walk. That's the whole crazy thing about it. You know what I'm saying? I don't hate him. I don't like him. I don't love him. But he wants to see us all against each other. His dream is to see us all get dusted. Youths from his end to get dusted. Because he wants to eliminate us. And he wants us to eliminate each other. And put us all against each other. Instead of uplifting us and bringing us all together, he likes us to go against one another. But he tries. So he can eliminate us and get rid of the competition. So he can keep himself a big throne, a delusional throne. So he can win. So he can be the king on the storm. So guess what? I'm gonna always speak the truth regardless. And other artists that are as big as him, like Kanye West, Jay Z, etc., etc., legends that are bigger than I've been doing it before, I mean, show us more love than him. That's the whole crazy thing about it. So I'm rocking with Kanye on this one. Black Power. Yeah, Four months tried. after these he's videos tried. were posted, Mo G tried. would sit down for his first interview since 2016 and throw a few subliminal shots at his former friend. Yeah, man, man. You know what I'm saying? And he said, then I hit him with the hotline. Chris Breezy with the dance moves. Mo G with the dance moves. Av Boy with the dance moves. About to slap my hood back on, but that was nothing but love, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But to speak about that record, I don't know if I should even speak about that record. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? But it's a good record though, you know what I'm saying? You feel me? But I'm not here to speak on next people's business or nothing, you know what I'm saying? Out of respect and out of love, you know what I'm saying? It ain't the right thing to do, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people in the industry are followers, you know what I'm saying? They're not leaders, you know what I'm saying? You feel me? They just follow what the trend is, you know what I'm saying? They don't know how to make their own trend, you know what I'm saying? And just start their own wave or whatever, you know what I'm saying? That's what, you know what I'm saying? got to do in the industry. Everyone got to stop watching each other. Everyone got to start watching themselves and just do what they got to do to elevate themselves, you feel me? And to get through those obstacles, like every day God's gonna throw you obstacles. Life's a test, you know what I'm saying? You just gotta, you know what I'm saying, pray, you know what I'm saying, do your best and stay blessed and never stress, you know what I'm saying? You feel me? I think it's safe to say Moji wasn't a fan favorite in 2018, especially after videos of him surfaced, kicking it with Driftwood Court based rapper Pressa. The link up was highly controversial, considering the killer of Smoke Dog was Driftwood Court based rapper 21 Neat. As stated before, after Smoke Dog's death, rivalries were formed. One of them was Regent Park and Driftwood Court. Driftwood affiliates like even coined K. the term HGK, an abbreviation for Halal Gang Killer, and they didn't hesitate to scream it to the world. Hey yo, we don't live downtown, but we always deep. Always deep. We outside, we outside. You feel me? So when Pressa and Moji linked up, the narrative of Moji being a backstabber started to gain traction. Moji didn't respond to the critics though. Instead, he put his energy into new music. He might be H uh, HGK too. He switched up on his guys. Remember, he unfollowed all his members. A different ball game. Hey. Raptors. 
they just want a red on June 13, 2019, history was made. The Toronto Raptors won their franchise's first NBA title. The historic feat brought together a city like never before. It even inspired Moji to release new music. Ball Game, a song dedicated to the new NBA champions, was released on Canada Day, and it reached nearly 50k views in just under a week after its release, which isn't bad for someone like Moji, who rarely put out music. 2019 wasn't any different, because the next time the scene would hear from him again would be on January 25th, 2021. But this time, it had nothing to do with music. Listen, brother, if anyone understands, I understand, you know what I'm saying? That's why, that's why I tell you I always have forgiveness in my heart for you. Because <clears throat> that shit's overwhelming, man, and it was a different time. You know, like you said, you were young and... This shit can be confusing, man, when it's all just forwarding at you so fast, like, you know, different people showing you love. You don't know if it's real. You don't know if it's fake. Then you have real friends telling you shit that maybe serves their own purpose or their own agenda. But it's like, I just want you to know, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I put that shit to rest a long time ago, man. Like I said, I only have love for you, brother. I wish the best for you always, you know? And I hope you know I mean that, man, for real. After nearly two years of inactivity, Moji would return to Instagram with a major announcement. He revealed a lengthy conversation between him and Drake, where they both put their pride to the side and hashed things out, officially ending their five-year beef. In one message, Drake writes, You have a good heart, I know that, some bumps along the way, but, you're a blessed G. Moji replied, You're welcome, brother. I really appreciate that. I always remember what you did for me. You're a legend to me, fam. You know I have nothing but love for you. Sometimes in life we just have the wrong people around us. You feel me? Drake responded with, Trust me, I never even had to forgive you in my heart because I loved you like a brother the whole time. We are connected for life, through our city and through the guys. And just know, I always wanted the best for you. Man, you are a star and you had a light and that's what everyone saw in you. To see these two finally hash things out after five years was a beautiful thing to see, but the positivity for Moji was short-lived. A few months after these messages were released, we begin to get an idea of who those wrong people he was referring to just might be. April 11th, 2022, Moji would go live on Instagram with a lot to get off his chest. He started the stream off by shouting out people you would least expect. From the Wasses, Better not be lacking a caravana. Woo! to top five. Moji oh, was God, showing was love HGK. to people who at one point didn't hesitate to diss his loved ones. He also seemingly mocked Mustafa the poet by singing along to one of his songs. Here's one thing you need to do before you buy anything online. Don't spend another dime on Amazon. As viewers began spamming the comments pointing out what everyone was thinking, Regent Park rap icon, Tyke, who at the time was incarcerated, would join the live stream to set some things straight. He started off by giving Moji his flowers, but towards the end of his rare appearance, Tyke confronted Moji for tarnishing his reputation during his beef with Drake. Moji been through his ups and downs, sometimes he listens, sometimes he don't, sometimes he's hard-headed, sometimes he's ignorant, sometimes he's all types of you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the love was always there and the respect was always there. So, you know, this nigga always showed me love and shit like that. So, I don't know what it is. Yo, I told you already, you disappointed me in a couple of certain situations and shit, you know? I told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I told yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you you let me down and shit. You made yeah. me look bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, with that one situation, I know what you're talking about. What, what, mm -hmm. like, what, what my boys, people, right? With the boy, you know, you don't gotta yeah, yeah, with yeah, the boy, you know, like let, let the world know you, you put you made me look up because I put my life, my, yeah. I put my name on the line for you, brother. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, I fuck with you like that. You know what I'm saying? Fuck. Okay, thank you, thank you. you know I can appreciate yeah, the fact that you can keep it real. You know what I'm saying? 
and tell me that's good okay. yeah. can you let the world know that please let the yeah, world know yeah, I let the world know that I let, I let, I let Chubbs know that period that they are you know what I'm saying? My nigga got cheese coming from so the fuck you doing, fam? I'm fully just squashed it. Mm-hmm. All right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, know, you made me look like a fool, man. Like, you made me look stupid. Go get into it if you want to. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, cool. Shout out, shout out to Chubb, though. Shout out to, to p Ren. Shout out to Otto. No shit like that. You know me? I can only do so much. <laughs> I, I tried. I tried, you know? Yeah. I had a little Rest in peace, moment. Clutch. You know what I'm saying? I'm not <laughs> My bad, you know me, I don't trust people like that, you know what I'm saying? But at least I do what I do. These don't even, these scared to, 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 to fucking even believe in themselves, to move how they want to move. These are not their own men, my own men, fam. At the end of the day, fam, we just left me for that. And I put all the niggas on, long story short, just how we just gonna keep it. And I still wish them the best. As the near one hour stream was coming to an end, Tyke would address certain people who he felt were destroying Regent Park's legacy. One of them was Puffy L's. The little Puffy, you should stop rapping, dude. Like, not even this has nothing to do with any street shit, no hood shit. Like, this is like, yo, he just <laughs> sucks in the rap. Like, yo. But yo, Puffy, Puffy's gonna see this shit. Stop rapping, man. Like, you're trash, dude. You make the hood look bad, <laughs> man. Like, and a real legendary black a real legendary step and it's like you're the who people are talking about it's like it's, it's sad you know so just just fall back man get your money take care of your family mm. i'm talking to puffy right now <laughs> hey i want you to come to our 10x growth conference this year for free by the way for free completely free the comments made by the two Parkers didn't sit well for some people because four days after the live stream aired, Moji's family home would be targeted in a drive-by shooting on back-to-back nights. nights. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Now, this was the last straw for Moji. For weeks preceding the shooting, he would go on an Instagram live tirade to publicly it. denounce his it. affiliations with Halal Gang, with him it. even screaming HGK at one point. I told you he was HGK! <laughs> I told you, nigga. Put your kids on. He also took shots at all Regent Park rappers for not making Toronto's Rolling Loud lineup, which was set to take place in September. Let's talk about how you guys been rapping for six years. You guys are not even on Rolling Loud. About to cry. You kids didn't make it to Rolling Loud. That's sad. And and some of the ones made it to Rolling Loud. Some of the towns made it to Rolling Loud. From all ends of the city made it to Rolling Loud. You guys didn't even make it to Rolling Loud. That is shameful. If I was you guys, I'll quit rapping. Stop rapping. Giving you guys all the sauce. You guys had no drip, never did. Mo, we're doing the show. We need you, fam. We need you out here, fam. 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 We need you, fam. <laughs> oh, good old days. Yo, Moji, fam. We need you at the show, fam. Man, we need you here, fam. We need the Ginobili, fam. The fans want to see you, fam. <laughs> Puffy, what? I had to bench Puffy here, hope. The traders. She switched up to 10 bands. For 10 bands. How broke are you guys? 10 bands? And then your whole career is from off. You kids are high. You could have got touched to your hiding. All I guess pisses me off. Don't fucking make me pack the kids, bro. Or the quad Abby just now. All you guys are legends. This summer. My nose. Shut up. Okay, you guys wiped. Play around, kids. Play around this summer. Come outside. I want all you guys to come outside. I drop a little piece around for all you guys. Come green, outside. Green light. Come outside. This whole summer, you guys getting wiped. Shut up. This is going to get wiped. This was a side of Moji the scene has never seen before, and it only got worse from here. Less than a week after his live tirade, He's Moji a dropped a diss track oh targeting Mustafa the Poet and Puffy L's. From claiming Mustafa used Smoke Dog's death for personal gain, to calling Puffy L's a washed up basketball player, Moji didn't hold back in the slightest. Born and raised in Japan, nigga. Adam, born on the Finch, moved to Regent in 98. Born on the Finch in 96, moved to Regent in 98. Ben had a block straight, nigga. Oh, you did. Oh, you run crazy. Put you on Nas one mic and you lost them. We all know you didn't bring your smoke to the Junos. After making money off Smoke Dog's death, you were shame, you were lame. What comes next? Every century go to his family, you suspect. Waited for niggas to die to make records like stay alive. Cause when Honor was alive, you was never allowed. 
God don't like ugly, you more of a child, so foul. And I value a lot of make money off the debt. A boy I know a technique who ain't got nothing left. The truth is you're a disgusting, despicable kid. Smile and laugh on our BZ got killed by the pigs from that day on you was never my nick Celebrating the death of black Muslim brothers Uncle Tom ass nigga with no color Puffy don't call yourself a top Mali When we all know we can't speak Somali Real lions fought and died for the country you Six yeah. eight monkey fell basketball junkie your real name oh. stutter You never been gutter You got issues you're softer than tissue Acting hard body but I don't care Zillow helped me land this Airbnb listing Yes Zillow now here's the craziest part. A week after they the gotta, release of the diss track, pow, pow. it appears Halal Gang got the green light to finally respond to Moji. It began with Mustafa the Poet posting this message to his Instagram story. LOL, there's not one you mentioned in this video who rocks with you. You've only ever been a burden to this hood. All the lawyer fees, funeral costs, community programming. Where were you when we were covering that? You're nothing but a mascot and you need to seek medical attention. Linking the up with these up. exhausted oh. ops who've only ridiculed our dead. All for what? A crumb of cloud. You're as desperate as they are. He further added, Moji, I don't want anyone to get touched over this, so let's settle this like real n Fight me. I'll knock you out in the cage court like I used to back in the days. We can invite the whole city. You'll have the stage you desperately want. Moji didn't waste any time responding to Mustafa. In a video which appears to be recorded at Regent Park's cage court, not only did he accept the challenge to fight, but Moji also took the opportunity to air out even more of Mustafa's dirty laundry. Light in the public like that. I'm in the cage court right now. Challenge accepted. I'm in my hood anytime I want. I walk dole. I walk with just me and Allah. You can't do that. Now, me and you know you can't do that. Another thing is, don't act like you pay His head is on a services. swivel. You never pay for no funeral services in your life. You know the messages pay for it. You know their families paid for it. All these individuals that died from our community, their families have paid for it. Don't do despicable acts and act like you paid for things and programmings and lawyer fees. If you had something to pay for, you would have paid for it because they look like bums on the Juno stage. You know, you and I know they look like bums on the Juno stage. Even you look like a bum. You mm. wear white Air Forces. You're so desk. You're not Dr. Drew. Look at me. Look, look how fly I stay. You guys I don't like the Jordan. Like me. And let's not talk about clout. I'm not doing none of this for clout. Because I was the first in the hood with clout. You know that too. Me and you know that. And you wasn't allowed to hang. If Smoke thought was your friend, how come you ain't in trap house doing numbers? If I was your friend, how come you ain't still by the robber? You were only in Safe's video field because Safe was the only friend that actually liked you. And let you hang with him. So you should thank the man, if anything. You know what I mean? You despicable kid. Mm. And please, let me tell you something. The truth hurts, doesn't it? You know what I'm saying? But yo, challenge accepted. I'm in the cage court right now, live. These kids are not outside. I'll make that clear again. These kids are not outside. Do not let them fool you. And when you guys became the face of the hood, you guys let the hood go to tarnish, to waste, garbage. Back in the days, to say you're from Regent Park was an honorable thing. Now you say you're from Regent Park, people want to step on you like Mustafa the poet. You see what I'm trying to say? Like, come on. You guys not but snakes and musk and goofs. And you're the biggest mascot for HG. And them don't even like you. And Arnold did beat you up. And I had the facts. And there's a lot more where that came from. A lot is going to come out. Keep playing around. Keep playing around like you like you want. Keep this. playing you these media this. games. None of you had this drip or sauce. And none of you niggas have a brave heart like me. You guys are awesome. Frauds. You know that. And I know that. And I'm here in the 3 p.m. And I'm in the cage. I don't see no one here. Come on, the truth hurts, right? And what do you mean exhausted ops? What ops are exhausted? You guys seem exhausted. Talking about, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. Screaming on stage to stay alive. Ebb to Alec. And stop making songs about dead people. You know what I'm saying? Benefiting off the dead. You, you fucking with the nine. niggas that was dissing y'all dead, nigga. Hood, kid. Moments after this video was released, Mustafa would DM Moji on Instagram saying, I'm traveling for the next few weeks because I actually have a career you bum ass. I'm good to fight on the 22nd or 23rd in Toronto, Cage Court, after Mugrib. Make sure you take your meds next week. As the fight date got closer, Moji would post a number of videos of him mock training for the big event, even going as far as taping a picture of Mustafa on a punching bag. Yo, y'all love trolling, bro. Like, I only imagine, like, if he had real clout, feel me? Him in top five would have been crazy. Like, them niggas would have been mad funny. Hey, 
I might got the poet. I might go with the poet on this one. Now you don't want to fight. You're the definition of a despicable kid. You fucking love despicable kids. You know where you belong? You belong in the sewer. You are a re you are irrelevant, bitch. Look here. You look like a fucking death symbol. You look like a real death symbol. You belong in the sewer for your despicable ass. Don't ever call a real nigga out like Moji and say you want to fight. Puffy, you better watch yourself, yo. You, listen. You little you. You laugh you want to fight and you want to fight. Well, you belong because I can't make this call. Sewage. And I'm in peel right now. Sewage. Sewage. Fuck it. You belong in the sewage, you fucking sewer rat. You fucking muscat. Don't ever call a real nigga out. Are you stupid? This is running away. Come on, man. I don't even try, man. I look better than you, poor man. Yo, listen, poor man. You would never win this one in your life. You see, you would have got this if you fought, but you're scared to fight. You know what I'm saying? But you would never win this one in your life. You despicable kid. Puffy Oz, you never got a lag like this in your life. You think I care about rap? I get racks, you fucking goof kids. Come outside. You fucking play goof the kids. Fucking block. You kids do not play the fucking block. I got bands on the app right where I grew up, goof kids. Bitch ass niggas. Get your lag up. Get your funds up. Fucking nasty. Nice. Unfortunately, the highly anticipated fight would be called off by Puffy Ells, who would go on to say, No one's fighting no one because I said so. Pray for the delusional cap dancer. I've been trying to get him help since preschool. Also been saving him since the late 90s. Was cool with Lil Homie 2016 to 2018. 2019, I ain't want to be his friend no more. So he went and made new ones. Make sure them boys renew his medical prescription. The battle between the Parkers continued into the next month, and on the anniversary of Smoke Dog's death, things were no different. It began with Moji appearing on a live stream featuring Boulevard Biz, who had previously made songs dissing the late rapper. During the live, that's your the two would preview a new song, young. a remix of Still by the Rabba. Nah. The track shook Toronto's underground oh. scene to its core because the street anthem was remixed into a diss track aimed at Halal Gang. On the song were also a few bars targeting Smoke Dog, which didn't win many fans over. He ain't making past the medics, man. He really need a doctor. Ten shots to his face is doing proper. Skinny L's Moji, I'm a problem. Wick Woods, nigga, I'm a part. Grrr. 21 shots for your partner. HCK, bitch, that's the roster. Young guy, Molly's and some rosters. Call bro, bitch, young, go quick. I had to bench Puffy a whole bitch. Moji's Halal Gang smear campaign would come to an end as both sides would stop acknowledging each other soon after this live stream aired. By the end of the year, Mustafa would go on to interview UFC champion Khabib, while Puffy Ells would come out of musical retirement and drop a track featuring Safe. Moji, on the other hand, would go ghost once again. No more updates, music, or even Instagram live streams. The smear campaign would be the last time the scene would hear from him. As unpopular of an opinion this may seem, Moji not only paved the way for himself and those close to him, but for aspiring artists all over the city. Being raised on a block that only knew struggle, Moji wasn't born with the tools to become a star. After all, he dropped out of school at just 10 years old. Yeah, he had no school. choice but to make do with what he had and that gritty realism was projected in his music. A tale full of ups and downs, Moji's story is one for the books. He fucked that up for his family, man. He fucked that up. He fucked the bag up for his family. I'm doing weird shit. Like, he just doing weird shit. I, 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 don't even, I, can't, I can't even explain, like, this weird shit that he was doing. Like, he had the opportunity. Drake gave him the opportunity, everything he wanted, and he fucked up. Like, he... 
whoever was talking to him or whatever, when he didn't take his meds or some shit, the nigga just started, the, the demons started getting to him real bad, like, real bad. Because this shit don't make no sense to me, like, Drake gave you the Moji with the dance move, Ab Boy with the dance move, bro, he gave you two lines, he shouting you out, and you fuck up the bag over some, a, a little... You ain't even do the song. Let's say you ain't even do the reference of the song. You probably gave him a line in the song, nigga. He gave you 500. Nigga, take the 500, nigga, and go about your day. You next to the biggest nigga in Toronto and you fuck up? Nigga, don't be thinking, bro. I'm next to the biggest nigga in Toronto. The biggest nigga in Toronto saying my name, doing my move. Feel me? I'm chilling. I'm chilling. I'm chilling, bro. Sometimes you just gotta learn how to chill, bro. Like, your time is not yet. Like, you gotta wait until it's your time. Like, you know what I mean? Just wait. He could have signed to Drake. Man, out of here. Doing a little OVO show, a little festival. So, me performing here, here, here. One day got that Drake feature. I'm out of here, bro. But you doing a little dumb shit, be acting like a female. You know what I mean? Exposing people. Like, trolling them. Like, you know what I mean? Niggas don't like that shit, bro. You know what I mean? But, um,. It was good marketing, I guess you wouldn't say. You put attention on yourself, but I don't think niggas like that, though. For me, I don't think Drake fuck with that shit. But um, let me know how y'all feel. Put in the comments. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Giggy, y'all already know the vibes, man. You give life a new meaning when you dreaming. This shit, boy, dream. I'm out of here, Giggy. Fake niggas, we don't do it all. Fake niggas, we don't do it all. Hardcore, hardcore. Weirdos, weirdos.